Sloan Kettering, first and foremost, is a cancer centre. That's all we do here. But it's been set up so that we have a very strong basic science arm as well as a very strong clinical arm. And they're hugely integrated. We are also this highly efficient institution that actually can translate drugs, that actually can bring um, basic research right there to the bedside. We have a very defined clinical question that we want to answer in our patients and we've designed laboratories and, and recruited faculty to help answer some of these questions. We've got chemists, biologists, MDs, engineers, but we're all sort of linked by the, the common theme of using the unique properties of radioisotopes to improve cancer imaging and therapy. So radio pharmaceuticals are molecules, and they could be small molecules, peptides, antibodies, or even nanoparticles, which are radio labeled with an isotope. And this isotope can decay in a way that allows you to do either imaging or therapy. If it decays by gamma, then you can do SPET. If it decays by positron, you can do PET. And if it decays by a therapeutic emission, such as an alpha particle, then you can do therapy. We have two cyclotrons currently. Uh, we produce about 30 different compounds right now. Um, they're probably split up half biologics and half small molecules. On our uh, two cyclotrons, we're able to produce the traditional PET radionuclides, short-lived molecules of radionuclides that are used where gas or liquid targets are used to produce them. The main ones we make are F18 and carbon-11. And then on the second machine, where we have a solid target tree station, we are producing the longer-lived radionuclides, which we usually couple to proteins and biologic molecules. Um, and those are, those are Quidim-89 and I-124. For us, what's really the most important is to focus on the target. And then identifying and quantifying that target um, can be with fluorescence or PET or you name it, any um, imaging technology really that, that we can come up with. So we're designing probes to, uh, to diagnose uh, ovarian cancer at an earlier stage. Specifically with ovarian cancer, uh, it's difficult to do a biopsy, which is typically what you would do to, to diagnose other types of cancers. Um, so we want to develop probes that can non-invasively image ovarian cancer uh, in order to diagnose it. Zirconium can be used as an image, imaging agent to diagnose ovarian cancer at first, um, and then follow up with lutetium once the diagnosis has been made as a therapy agent. And I think that's where the real value of in vivo imaging lies. And the advantage of that is not only is it non-invasive, but it's in vivo, so all of the biochemical, metabolic, neurological, so forth and so on, uh, factors that impact the behavior, growth, progression of tumors in vivo are in play. You know, the, the holy grail when it comes to trying to find uh, tumor-specific markers uh, is, is, is uh, making sure that you have something that uh, is, is more abundant on tumors versus normal cells. And that's always tricky when you have some receptor that's naturally used in, in regular tissues. But uh, I think with the new technologies of uh, gene expression, proteomic arrays, we might be able to start teasing that out a little bit better than what traditionally had been used, such as you know, immunohistochemistry, for instance. PARP is an enzyme that's very important in DNA repair and PARP inhibitors are actually translated to the clinic right now for tumor treatments. And since PARP is overexpressed in many tumors, we developed a fluorescent version of one of the PARP inhibitors and uh, we're developing an application where we can use this as a mouthwash for patients to detect oral cancer early on. I was able to do that and we published these results and this was the basis for the clinical trial. So much of my work involves targeting the acidic extracellular environment produced by solid tumors with pH low insertion peptide. So essentially what happens is the pH drop encountered at uh, acidic tumor environments induces a structural change in the peptide so that the peptide inserts itself across the membrane in an alpha helical conformation. And that's sort of its basis for uptake and, and targeting and localization of, of radionuclides at the tumor site. One of the primary advantages of, of uh, targeting the acidic microenvironment is that it's independent of uh, receptors and proteins that are commonly imaged with other methods. So we'd expect this to be uh, applicable to, to a wide variety of, of uh, tumors as a sort of universal targeting agent. Much of what we do or what we try to do is to be quantitative, not just make pretty pictures. I mean, and our, our images often are spectacular, but the idea is to derive 
biologically meaningful information about a tumor, about its growth or metabolism, or its response to some treatment. Now the, the question is, can we use that information to choose specific therapies for our preclinical trials? Our focus right now has been pancreatic cancer, a uh, cancer that's categorically uh, lethal, um, uh, so there's, there's definitely an unmet need there. And the idea is that we might be able to build an imaging agent that tells us whether or not uh, a particular subset of patients will respond to either targeted therapy, uh, in some cases uh, antibody-based therapies, radioimmunotherapy. We're using an antibody-based approach and we've uh, conjugated the antibody to a zirconium so we can visualize it with PET. And we've been able to show specific binding in, in, in tumors that highly express our receptor, but not in those tumors that do not. I think the, the biggest benefit we can do is, or uh, that it can bring is better select patients for the type of radiation we give or even the amount of radiation we give. There's going to be a certain subset of patients that are maybe more sensitive to the radiation, so maybe they don't need as high a dose. One of the, the biggest advantages of in vivo imaging in a preclinical setting is that it is so readily translatable into the clinic. We use the very same modalities, as I've mentioned, that are now widely available in the clinic, like PET, CT, MR, uh, SPECT, ultrasound, and so forth. There's no assumptions, unrealistic or otherwise, uh, that we need to make in translating our image-derived data in a preclinical setting to what one would expect in a, in a clinical setting. And when you make molecules, when you make targeted imaging agents, um, and they have meaning and they have clinical relevance, then translation is just a natural next step. Mm -hmm.